We are really excited this morning to look at a, a several different perspectives. We have three different folks this morning that are going to be sharing with us, and uh, I'm excited for each and every one of them. And this morning is a time where uh, before we're kind of in between message series and things uh, every so often at Hope, and we look to take advantage of that and to, br- to bring and to, to express some really special emphases, and this is, this is one of them this morning. You see on the screen, go into all the world. And last week, actually, we had a baptism service here, if you remember that. And we baptized uh, three people, and we got to hear their testimonies and hear of what God has done in their hearts to reach them in a personal relationship with Jesus. And uh, I used a scripture last week from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus said to his followers, go into all the world and make disciples of all people, baptizing them and teaching them everything that I've commanded you to obey. And he says, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age, to imply as you're doing that, as you are going and making disciples, as you are teaching, as you are baptizing, that God is with us in doing that. We want to do the things that inhabit the presence of God. Where God is, that's where we want to be. And as a church, we think about the first part of that phrase, go into all the world. We want to break that down this morning a bit, and we want to talk about and share from some different parts of the world. What does it mean to go into all the world? You see, in your bulletin, there's a little title. It's called Bigger Than Us, and we've been talking about that, uh, just a little bit of uh, some phrasing, bigger than us, that, that God's word God's word and his work, more specifically, is bigger than us. This week I wrote about that in the E! News, and maybe you've read that, and you've kind of been prepped a little bit for where we're headed today, but just some thoughts on my heart for our church and and our leadership, our elders in specific. We've talked about this, and we pray about this, and we want to follow God's leading in this, about what does it mean that God's work is bigger than us, and there is a going into all the world component of being a church here at Morristown. You see, we talk about things like Hope University or Grow Groups or our children's ministry or youth ministry or our worship time right here this morning. These things are all perfect and great and good, and we should take advantage of all of those things that are for our growth. Our mission as a church is to reach and lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus. We want to do our best with that mission right here in our backyard, in our neighborhood, with you, with all of us together. But it's bigger than us. If we stop with things that are great and happening and growing in our lives, and it's this kind of safe environment right inside these walls, (laughs) we have missed so much. We have missed so, so much. This morning, it's all of our opportunity to look at some things that God is doing in the world through some folks right here at Hope who can represent that for some of their experiences, as well as uh, for some that are on the other side of the world uh, that, um, that we can hear about some of those things that are taking place through some other uh, folks that maybe you've commonly heard the word missionaries or, or people who are serving through missions. This is that aspect of going into all of the world, not just right here in this backyard, this neighborhood, this community, but it's bigger than us to go into all the world. But God uses us. It's kind of that um, irony where, yes, we need to grow, we need to be reached, but not just for us to be grown and to uh, to be reached and to be led, but to be taken out and to be ones who are sent and who go because it is bigger than us. So this morning we're going to hear from three. Uh, Sandy Cook is one. Jess Kaminsky is another. These two uh, women go here to Hope. You may know them uh, from some groups or interactions over the past couple of years. Maybe you've met Sandy and Jess. Uh, And then we were supposed to actually have uh, a missionary from West Africa whose name is Diona Thomas. And uh, Diona, we have not heard from him. Uh, Over the past few weeks, uh, to our knowledge, his plane has not arrived uh, here at JFK. Uh, He has a conference uh, actually later this week in Indianapolis. Uh, We were lining him up, but he's not here in the United States, and we haven't heard uh, anything. So actually, 
Um, we have Dave Hine with us here who works with Diona very closely, and uh, we're just glad for the Lord's provision of Dave uh, this morning as well. Uh, but uh, we do want to pray uh, for Diona because when you don't hear from someone, from Liberia, West Africa, where there was an Ebola outbreak and where there's loads of political unrest and where there's loads of just daily dangers and different things. Uh, we don't know actually why we have not heard uh, from Diona up to this point. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to pray for Diona right now because he was supposed to be here, but I want to lift him up and then I'll introduce Sandy Cook for this morning. Jesus, we uh, want to pray for Diona as we just mentioned him. We uh, thank you that he is uh, working, he is called of you, God, to serve in this country of Liberia, West Africa. We thank you for his work through the Ebola outbreak, God, that you used him in a powerful way, that uh, you used him not only to represent the message and the truth of Jesus Christ and of God's word, but you've also used him with relief effort, efforts and compassion and care. And God, I pray for his protection. I pray that he and his family would be safe. God, uh, I pray soon that we would be able to hear word from him, uh, that he is well, that he is alive and well and safe. God, uh, serving you in other parts of the world, even as I just speak these words, brings to us just an awareness that there's risk. There's risks, greater risks than uh, we daily at all wrestle with here uh, in our uh, particular environment. But uh, God, we just stop and we think about Diona this morning. We pray that he would be protected and shielded and kept by you. Um, we miss not being able to have him here this morning, Lord. Uh, but we trust you and your sovereignty and your power and your protection. And we ask that you would reach into his life and his family and let them know, God, uh, that there are folks over on the other side of the world that are praying for them this morning as an extended part of the body of Christ. Uh, so we pray over Diona Thomas, and uh, we thank you this morning, God, that we can have our eyes opened to things like this as we see that it's bigger than us, and we are the ones to go into all the world as your followers. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to bring Sandy Cook uh, up at this time. Come on up, Sandy. And um, Sandy has uh, been attending Hope for, come on over, for about a year to two, and uh, she has been to several different locations in the world. I asked Sandy if she would share about her recent mission trip uh, to Ukraine, and uh, no doubt you've heard about things on the news with Ukraine, uh, but Sandy went over recently to Ukraine and uh, shared Jesus with people. So Sandy, you just take it from here and uh, share what God has on your heart. We welcome you. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Let me assure you that I am the least likely candidate for the mission trip. Uh, I am standing as a testimony of God's transforming power and his grace because uh, it's an underestimate uh, to tell you that as a child I was so shy and timid. I stuttered. I, I would never stand in front of people. But when I came to Christ, when I heard about Jesus, he put in me a love for people and a desire to share my faith. Uh, he did something pretty interesting. Uh, he would, you know, prompt me to talk to a woman in, in Kmart and pray with her. And it amazed me that out of my mouth came words of knowledge and comfort, and she would receive the Lord. And, and I shared with friends and family, sometimes a little bit, um, <laughs> zeal, no wisdom, but uh, God refined me, and I continued to share my faith, and uh, oh, one day, uh, as I was getting ready to go to church, uh, to my dismay, I hear this still, small voice, Sandy, I want you to go to Russia, and oh my goodness, having grown up in the Cold War, and remembering sirens and air raid drills where I had to hide under my desk and under cafeteria tables because the Russians are coming, I did not have any love to share for the Russian people. They were our enemies. I mean, I saw movies of these terrible spies and murders, and so I'm thinking, okay, Lord, uh, please, I hope this is not you talking to me. Maybe it's just a weird thought. But as the next couple weeks went 
uh, through. There are amazing stories I could tell you, but I knew without a shadow of a doubt, he wanted me to go. I wanted to be obedient. There is a scripture in Isaiah 6, 8 that, that the Lord is saying, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. And so off I went first to the passport uh, place and standing in line, and everyone's talking about where they're going, so-and-so's going to Italy, this guy's going to France, then all eyes turn to me, where are you going? Uh, Russia? Oh my goodness, this guy standing next to me, he grabs me and says, no, that's a dangerous place. I'm an international pilot. Every time I've gone to Russia, I've been mugged and drugged, and you are a woman. Not a good place for you. Oh, well, this scaredy cat, um, God gave the courage, and I managed to go over to Russia. My first mission trip was, you know, shortly after the wall fell and communist fell, and so I, I did get to Russia, and God did some amazing things. I was hooked on mission trips. And um, uh, so that's kind of how I ended up in, in the Ukraine. Um, when, I, when God gave me a love for the Russian people, he also put a desire in me to go to Russian language school for missionaries so that I didn't have to depend on interpreters because I had some interesting experience with interpreters. So um, I've been as far north and Siberia, uh, north of the Arctic Circle. I've been down uh, the former Soviet Union as far as like the China area. I've been to countries that I've never heard of, never imagined, but God had that for me. And it was an amazing adventure, and it still is. Missions is still the passion and highlight of my life. And I'm just ordinarily old, old you know, shy me. But um, uh, if you could um, put up the... Uh, the first screen, uh, you're probably all aware from the news that um, Ukraine is really struggling. As of uh, August, there have been 7,000 people killed, 17,000 people wounded. It, the, these people are losing their husbands, their wives, their sons, their brothers, their neighbors, and their hearts are really crying out for hope and love. And uh, the mission trip that I went to was with Jewish Voice. And it was primarily geared to reach um, not only the Ukrainians that, um, uh, well, we've, there are a million people I forgot to mention, a million people or more that have been displaced because of the military conflict. They're in refugee camps. And I'll have the opportunity to go there next year and work in the refugee camps. So anyhow, um, God prepared me uh, after I uh, became born again to share my faith. Uh, wherever he would lead, I was pretty obedient. So um, street ministry and sharing love and faith was a simple thing. You see this woman here who lost her son. I was able to pray with her and comfort her and invite her to hear uh, more about Jesus Christ. She did pray, but these people need to be discipled, and we connected in Ukraine with a Messianic congregation that was really on target with discipling 24-7 prayer through the night that God would move in a powerful way, touch hearts, and that people would come to Jesus Christ, that Jews would hear about their Messiah. So we put on five uh, festivals. But you can put the next uh, slide up, please. Um, you know, we're told to go out into all the world, to Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus' last words as he was going up, ascending into heaven, was go into all the world. The Holy Spirit will give you power to testify about me in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And I was kind of thinking, well, I kind of went to the uttermost parts of the world before I went to uh, Israel and, and Samaria and all those places. But our Jerusalems are right here, and that's how he started training me. And uh, we're told to comfort people and to prepare the way of the Lord. I think God's coming soon. And uh, so 
as a mission trip with Jewish Voice Ministries, we went into the streets and we evangelized. We invited people. Um, there's a, uh, a word there that says, uh, go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come, that my house will be filled. And boy, did God do amazing things. We filled five nights in a row, not only a huge um, auditorium, uh, well, it's the largest, most prestigious opera house in, in all of Europe it's called the um, Odessa um, Opera House that I think I have a picture of. And um, so as we went on the streets, we handed out inv invitations. We led lots of people to Christ. They, they came hours, like three hours ahead of time to go and hear about Jesus, the Messiah, because we had primetime TV uh, ads, uh, billboards all over. The city was, uh, a lot of them were very excited. There was a lot of opposition. Um, there was, it was touch and go. We almost didn't get uh, an opera house uh, to be there. But not only did we get that, but the overflow and, and the turnout was so great, they also gave us the sports stadium. So we had two simultaneous um, uh, presentations of the gospel, music and dancing. That's a concert, um, Marie Scalara, one of the top violinists in all of, of uh, the world. And uh, we were able through dance and drama and music and testimonies lead thousands. I mean, um, we estimate about 4,000 a night. And um, the Messianic congregation that we uh, partnered with were very faithful to contact the people that were uh, so many of them that, that filled out cards and wanted to know more and come to um, the congregation. Um, and so it was a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, turnout. God did exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever hope and ask for. Um, they stayed for hours. What you can see right now, after we prayed for them, they came up with prayer. We, for prayer, we led a lot to the Lord. And then um, here, they wanted to stay. So they were encore after encore. This was in the stadio, stadium, rather, and they could see what was going on simultaneously in the opera house. And these people were praising the Lord, dancing, singing. We couldn't get them to go home hours afterwards. So it was amazing. And... Um, I've, I, I just want to um, end with uh, one story and how God equips us, even though it can be scary. You can see me with this uh, group of uh, soldiers here. Ah, it's not my nature to stop a platoon and say, hey, um, would you mind? I need to speak with you. I've got a message for you soldiers. You know, here they're going on the war front. They could be killed. And um, the Lord reminded me the first time I went to Russia, I had a very interesting experience. I have a, a little boy, a 12-year-old skinny um, son of a pastor who was a missionary in Russia, and he was my interpreter. So we're kind of going across this uh, big town square filled with soldiers smoking and, and drinking, and all of a sudden, there I heard them kind of like whistling and cat calling to me, and I go, oh my goodness, in my flesh, I wanted, I was repelled, wanted to run in the opposite direction, and God stopped me dead on my tracks, and I grabbed this little boy's hand and said, here, we need to talk to them, and I'm saying, well, well Lord, what am I going to say, and he gave me the boldness, and I told him to tell them, excuse me, I didn't come thousands of miles to be disrespected uh, by you. You don't know who you're talking to. And they looked at me. They said, well, who are you? I said, my father is the commander of the biggest army in the universe. And they said, what? Well, of course, they were intrigued. So I said, look, I didn't come um, to to be disrespected, but if you want to know why I did come, I have a, I have a tremendous 
a thing to tell you. So, of course, that led into the gospel. And, oh, oh, let me just say, when I said that, this little boy looked at me and said, are you sure you want me to say that? And I said, yeah. So here he's shaking in his boots, and, and he told them that. Well, these soldiers, these rowdy, rough-necked guys, tears streaming down their eyes saying, how could God forgive us? We are trained killers. So I got a chance to share the love and forgiveness of God. And was it a coincidence that this little boy standing here interpreting for me had cards in his pocket. His dad was the neighborhood pastor, a missionary. So these, many of them received Christ. We were given, you know, this little boy gave the directions how to get to the house of the Lord so they could be discipled. And I mean, the stories could go on and on. God does amazing things with ordinary people like me. I never thought I could do such a thing, but I'm so glad that he gave me the grace and the courage to be obedient to his calling, to a place that I really didn't want to go. Lord, Russia, why not Tahiti or, you know, somewhere really nice, but Russia? No. But I am so grateful. Missions is still the highlight and passion of my life. And there's no thing more exciting for me than to impact the lo lives for eternity. And that's what we've done with this and many other uh, mission groups. And if he can use me, of all people, he can use you. And I'm so grateful uh, that I heard his call and I followed his call. And I'm going to end with a, a particular scripture that's very close to my heart. And I'll say it in Russian first, and then I'll tell you in English. It's from First Corinthians 2, 9. It's the first, um, when I went to Russian language school, it's the first thing I memorized other than John 3, 16. I has not seen nor ear heard or even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them who love him. And it goes on to say it's now. We do have the mind of Christ. So I urge you, if, if God, you know, step out of your comfort zone. If, call, if God calls you to go somewhere, he's going to empower you and he's going to equip you. And I can certainly say in my weakness, his strength was made perfect. So thank you so much for um, listening to me. God bless you. Stay right here. Sandy, stay, stay right here for a second. You know, uh, I've gotten to know you over the past year or two, and uh, I'm just hearing these things. I've heard a number of these stories through you uh, before. Uh, not all of them, so I, I learned something this morning, which is great. But um, I have to just say, hearing it and watching your passion and describe it, it gives us that sense that God's work is bigger than us. I mean, I know that you work right here in Cherry Hill area. I mean, you're just like, like we were talking, just a normal one of everybody else, you know, like, but you are just open to what God is doing, and that's your encouragement for people is to do the same. So thank yeah. you. And not just overseas. I mean, just yesterday at work, the Lord opened up the door. I led this girl to the Lord. She was losing her home and all, and I, and I shared my faith. Right there in the mall, she received Christ. I've been working with a Muslim guy who's, who is searching, reading the Koran. But over the last year, he comes to me and he asks me questions about the Bible and about being born again and Jesus. And so his name is uh, Suhail, the girl that I led to the Lord yesterday. Um, her name is Alisa. There have been co-workers and other people mm. that have come to Christ. Just yeah. me being, you know, yeah. we where we are is God's mission field. Yeah, it's but, bigger than us right here yeah. as well as over there. Yes, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank That's you great. so much. Thank you, Sandy. Great. Wow. Yeah, I, I think it's just so important, and as we hear from Jess Kaminsky in just a moment, and then Dave Hine, that you keep hearing this thing. It's bigger than us. There's something bigger than what I've got going on just in my own life and what I think I see and can do each day. And Sandy obviously starting out with an idea of just stretched 
in ways that you might not think. But then, look, God just meets right there to show you, look, it's bigger than you, and I'm bigger than you. And God calls us to that. So I want to bring up Jess Kaminsky. Uh, Jess, this year, earlier in 2015, she took a trip to Honduras, a mission trip to Honduras. And uh, come on up, Jess. And uh, also, she's been involved with something else here at Hope that we have a chance to uh, partner with this morning. I'll let her talk about that. Uh, but Jess, uh, take it away and just tell us about Honduras first to start. Great. Welcome. Thank you. My story couldn't be any more different from Sandy's if you had black and white. It's, it's amazing to see that both of us are here in this church and in this community, but the things that we've done have been so completely different. Sandy went out into the cities, and I went into the mountains. I'm living, I live in Morristown, but I'm originally from western Pennsylvania. And in that area where I'm from, there's a church called the Church of the Living Christ. And for the last 23 years, there's a pastor there who has been going down to Honduras and building churches for the people in poor areas. <coughs> Excuse me. So in 2012, my mother actually went for the first time. And when she came back, it was such a transformation that it, it was like a whole new person had been made into my mother. Like the life that I saw her in, in her eyes, I hadn't seen for a couple of years. She was so excited and so filled with joy that I said, I want to be a part of that. I want to know what that feeling is. And I said, if you go again, I want to go too. So in 2013, I actually went for the first time, and I went with my mom. And it was hard. I'll be honest with you. It was, it was an amazing experience. I loved every minute of it. But it was hard. It was 10 days of, of manual labor. I work for the government. I don't do manual labor. <laughs> Ever. Um, and it was, it was 10 days of being in, in extreme heat. It was 100 degrees every day. We had an hour and a half drive, one way, on a school bus, on dirt roads, going around donkeys and mules. It was crazy, but I loved it. It was, it was a passion in the people that I saw that were so excited to have a church built for them by a bunch of people from North America who they didn't know, they didn't care, they were just happy that we were there. During that trip, I learned so much about myself, and God worked so much in me to work on one of my biggest challenges in life, which is my patience. I'm one of those people, I like to have things done now in the way that I want it, and God said, uh-uh, it doesn't work that way here. During that trip, I learned not only patience, but I learned how to step back and not be in control. And by doing that, he prepared me for the trip that I took this year in January. I went with the same group, and it was a completely different experience. The place that we went wasn't quite as poor as the, the place that we went the first time that I went, but it was an area up in the mountains, no running water, no electricity, nobody has cars. It, there was just nothing there except for the, the people and their faith that they had and the little possessions that they had. And these people were so happy to have us there. All they wanted was to be a part of everything. It would be like clockwork. They would show up. Somebody would show up at about 11.45 every day and give us bananas. Just for, you know, thank you for being here. And they were so happy to give them to us. They got to work with the tools that we had. They'd never seen an electric sander or a drill or anything. And for, to be able to teach them how to use those tools and help them be a part of building their church, there's no feeling that can, can compare to what it feels like. It's just this being able to teach and share and love people who love you just for being there to help them. There were many times throughout my trip where there were evidences of God. And this picture, this first picture, is actually what we start with. So the people of the town, they actually build the foundation, and we do everything else. We build the pews, we build the roof, we build the window shutters, the doors. Everything that goes into the church, we build. And like I was saying, there's, there's, you just feel God every day. And the, the love of the people and the love of the people that you're working with is just amazing. And um, if you go to the next picture, this is a mural that one of our team members painted on the front of the church. So as part of building everything, we also paint it and decorate it and everything. And the gentleman who painted this was a man who was in his 60s, and in his youth, he liked to paint, but he wasn't anything where he did it regularly. And one day, his brother said, well, my brother knows how to paint, so he can do the mural. Guy hadn't picked up a paintbrush in over 20 years. 
And he said, okay, well, the Lord wants me to paint. This is what I'm going to make. And he did this all freehand just off the top of his head. And it was just beautiful. The, the mountains represented the mountains of the area that we were in, and, and the dove was something that was very important to the community that we were in. And the scripture that he chose was Mark 9.23, and, and it says, you know, everything is possible through God for those who believe. And the people just thought that that was amazing. One, on, the first, on the first trip that I took, we learned that um, there was a day where the pastor from, who organized the trip and the pastor who was down there, who was a long-term missionary, it's his nephew, they had gone out to buy supplies. And Honduras is a very dangerous area. And while they were out, they got robbed at gunpoint and had all their money stolen. And it was a big blow because it was a chunk of money for, for everybody to, uh, to lose. But back in Pennsylvania, my mother happened to come across, come into some money. And it was laid on her heart to donate it to the trip. And she did it anonymous, anonymously. Nobody knew. And during that trip, they had told about how the pastor and his nephew had gotten robbed. And it turned out that on the same day that my mom made the anonymous donation was the exact same day that they got robbed. And it was for the exact amount that was stolen. It's amazing. This picture that you're looking at here is the finished product. This is the front of the church. Um, this is after 10 days of work. And um, I wish that you could see all of it, all the different parts of it. But lots of hours, lots of love went into this. And it was just such a wonderful the people were so excited that people f had been praying for this church for 15 years for somebody to have a church up until this point they would just go to each other's houses all around the area and they would travel for miles five six seven miles on foot sometimes on horse or mule and now they had a place where everybody could come and meet and and be together and to be able to be a part of that was was just beautiful this picture is our group leader in orange and the gentleman that he's hugging is the pastor of the church. And this was right after he was given the keys to his church and saying, here you go, now this is yours. This is now your church to, so you can grow and build it and for everybody to be a part of it. And the pastor was so overwhelmed with joy and with gratitude and love that he just crumbled and sobbed with joy. It was the most beautiful moment of the entire trip. If I could say anything to anybody about how important it is to just listen to those little tugs at your heart that say, go do this. I, I strongly encourage you to go and, and go after it because I never thought that I would end up in Honduras building a church, not once but twice. I never thought that I would have the ability to make 32 pews in a matter of days. I never thought that I could learn a, few, a little bit of Spanish and learn how to communicate with not only the people who were my group as well as I did, but then the people of the communities who would come and talk to us and be with us and pray with us. I never thought I could, but I've done it twice and I can't wait to do it again. So God will give you the skills. God will give you everything that you need. And I look at this little guy and that little car that he's got in front of him, we made that for him. It was, it was just a little, little bit of leftover wood and we had time, so we said, here, you know, here you go. And I see this little guy, and I see he's going to be coming to this church for the rest of his life. And most likely, he's going to bring his kids there because the people don't leave their areas. They stay. So his kids are going to go to this church. And me, this you know, random girl from New Jersey, has been now a part of this church that's going to be impacting lives for generations to come. So I, I encourage you and you know, know that God will give you the skills. God will give you the strength. And the most amazing thing is, is that this group that I went with the last time, we were the smallest group that's ever gone. And they've been doing it for 23 years, the smallest group ever. There was only 24 of us. On a daily average, 19 of us would go up to the work site and work. And we ranged from age of 16 to 72. And how we all were able to get together and work together and get along and, and build a church is just amazing. So go after your dreams. This also, this little guy makes me think of what we do here back in at Hope, and one of the things that I've been lucky to be a part of is Operation Christmas Child. And there's a quick little video that I'd like you to see, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Hi, my name is Livia. I grew up in Romania in an orphanage for 10 years of my life. In the orphanage, uh, it was hard to live in there because there was a lot of hate, a lot of jealousy. There was no love, and I really wanted to be loved. And the biggest dream of my life was to have my own set of hair clips but I feel like I could not have them. 
because every gift I was given was always taken away. But one day everything changed. <laughs> when Operation Christmas Child came to my orphanage and a lady named Connie came to me, she handed me the shoebox and shared love with me and told me the gospel. And it meant a lot to me because I've been kissing pictures of Jesus and making cross signs and to hear the gospel for the very first time and the meaning meant a lot to me. And then when I got to open my shoebox gift at the very top of the box happened to be a big packet of hair clips. And I was so excited. I put every one of them in my hair. I could not believe my eyes. <laughs> Who can put something so simple that can make somebody's dream come true? Thank you so much for uh, packing the shoebox gifts. You really do impact our lives through the simple items in the gift. And we do get to hear the gospel and we do get to hear and understand what it means to know that there's hope out there. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I've been a part of the Operation Christmas Child here at Hope for the last four years. and. It has been truly humbling to see how much the people in, in our church alone have, have given. I think in the four years, and I don't know the exact number, but I know it's been at least 500 boxes that we've sent around the world. And to think that that's 500 kids who probably didn't get any kind of Christmas without us. There was um, times where we had the little kids downstairs help, and we've, we have you guys take boxes and, and fill them and pray over them and, and, and put in there the things that you think that you, these kids might love. This, this picture shows the stack of boxes that we had from last year, and I think last year was around 170, 50 or 70, I forget exactly. But the impact is huge. So you don't have to travel to Honduras. You don't have to travel to a foreign country, but you can go there just by taking the time to pick some things out for a little kid and pray over them and put them in a box. And you can actually have your box where you can have it sent to you, that, or you, it will let you know where your box was sent to. So you'll get an email that says, hey, your box went to Hungary and was able to brighten the life of this child. It's an amazing experience, and, and I think that every one of us could just take the time and, and impact the life of a child. Like I mentioned before, I work for the, um, for the government. I work with kids who've been taken out of their homes, and I see the impact of people who give to somebody who they don't know. Every year I see how much it affects kids. So to know that we can do this hundreds of times over just by the love that we have in this church is just absolutely amazing. Thank you, Jess. And Jess will be in the lobby after the service, maybe with uh, one or two others. And today you can go home with an open flat box that you will assemble yourselves. Jess is on tech help call this week. If you can't fold your box, you can call her. Um, but uh, today will be the day that um, we're just letting all the boxes go home with you, and then you can start over these next couple of weeks because for them to get over to their different places before Christmas, we've got to start handing them out now. So, Jess, thanks for sharing about Honduras and Operation Christmas Child. I think you help us see it's bigger than us, so thanks. Thanks so much. Great. I want to bring Dave Hine up at this time with me. Dave uh, is a friend of mine that uh, I've known him for uh, a number of years. Uh, we actually used to go to a uh, different church together uh, in, uh, down in Medford. And uh, Dave, this week, uh, he lives down in Florida now. Actually, we were just reminiscing that Dave and I, uh, uh, I don't know if we lived in Marlton at the same time, but we lived basically, lived basically within a couple of blocks of one another yeah. uh, down in Marlton. Uh, so... Uh, Dave is uh, a man who works with a group called World Ministries. Uh, he's the founder and president of it. Did I say that correctly, right? Correct. God used you to start that, and uh, Dave leads that organization. He's now down in Florida uh, with his wife. He has uh, older uh, children uh, as well, three of them. Uh, but Dave, uh, just kind of introduce yourself about uh, World Ministries, just in a real general kind of quick overview, and then we'll talk through some questions. Okay. As a ministry, we're about 15 years old, and our passion is essentially to train national pastors to lead multiplying church planting movements. And we train them to do this by giving them a training process of making multiplying disciples. So that's who we're all about. That's, that's what drives us every place we go. That's great. So on the screen, Florida is where you are. Right. Philippines, let's go back one frame here, uh, the listing there. Philippines, China, West Africa, Nepal, India, East Asia, 
Uh, there may be a couple of others, but these are the major ones, at least, that we know that World Ministries is working in. But you talk about nationals, meaning the people in those countries, right? Exactly. The nationals are the people who have grown up there, lived there. We are, wind up working mainly with national Christian leaders, local pastors who are fluent in their language, who know the culture, who know the people, who have a passion to reach their nation, but they want to do an even better job. Mm, great. So World Ministries comes in and resources and helps and leads and trains, builds relationship. Now, what's the personal connection for you with this? You know, how are, uh, you, you, know, you, didn't, you weren't born this way or wake up, you know, kind of, oh, I want to start an organization. Like, what's the personal connection for you in terms of this kind of work? Well, for me, it actually began when I was a college student. I was already a Christian, but I was discipled by a mature man of God who wasn't, uh, yeah, you know, I'm a college freshman, so a mature man of God was 27 years old. <laughs> but he has proven to be a lifelong mature man of God and a wonderful, wonderful mentor to me. I was discipled by him both personally and through a small group system that intentionally taught us how to make more disciples. And because of that, it was the commitment to disciple making and to small groups that has just given me this passion that has driven my life from this point forward. Great, and God took that. It's bigger than us. God did that in your life, yeah. and he took that, and now, at least by just what we see on the screen here, it's at least represented in those places, if not more, because of what God has done through the, use the word, multiplication of that. Yeah. True. It's bigger than us. Absolutely. Now, we have a picture, I think, of Dave uh, with a group of pastors. Where's this shot from and what was going on there, if you remember? I'm going to walk over because I can't yeah. remember exactly. I, I can see you're the only uh, you know, white guy in the middle of, of this group, so you, know, you shouldn't be ah. hard to pick yourself out there. As I get there, I can name you the names of half of those guys. Those are the most recent group of pastors that I had the chance to train in Manila in the Philippines, and that, for all I know, could have been taken as recently as January of uh, 2015. Yeah. So uh, those are pastors, most of them from Metro Manila, which is a humongous metro area. Mm -hmm. Now, Dave, uh, I want to transition to a couple of personal stories. I want to talk about Revy and then Diona. Of course, we prayed for Diona this morning, yeah. uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a real special connection uh, that we as a church have with them uh, that uh, I want to remind our people of, and then I want you to just kind of uh, talk about Revy and Diona and what they're doing in a moment. Cool. But I don't know if you all recall, but last year, it might have been around this time or as we approach more toward the Christmas season, uh, we had a series, a message series called Unstoppable. And the last message in that series was about the breadth and the width of God's kingdom. And what God is doing, not just in a church, see, we're used to coming to a church, 235 West Main Street, and we come to church, but the church, capital C, is the body of Christ universal all over this world. And as we closed out that series, we felt very compelled, our leadership at our church felt very compelled that we were going to take all of the offering and gifts for a whole week, whatever came in online or through the collection on Sunday morning, all of it, and we were going to give it out. We weren't going to keep any of it for ourselves for a whole week. And we've done that in different ways in times past for other reasons. And we looked at that and we saw, well, if God's work is the world over, the kingdom of God is that wide and that big, how can we support that work going on beyond us? Well, one of the ways that we uh, did that was we gave a financial gift to World Ministries. And as I wrote, um, I called Dave when we had done that, and I had a phone conversation with him. I said, Dave, you know, we talked about this in our church, and I just, we just meant it as a surprise, and we just didn't tell you about it in advance, but we're about to send uh, this check down to World Ministries. We want you to put it to good use uh, with uh, just how, how you know that God is doing his multiplying work throughout the world. Well, <clears throat> shortly after that, I got an email uh, from Dave mm. in uh, February, and he said, thank you for the awesome contributions from Hope. What a blessing. They were deposited in our fund that directly helps and equips uh, pastors and church planters. Well, I just presented the first gift from this fund to Revi Luciaha, a partner pastor in the Philippines. 
He is the best multiplier we have trained in the Philippines. We have become good friends through the years, and I have a long-established relationship with Revy as a mentor and encourager that began when he went through our training process. I was able to hand him funds from your gift, quite a large sum here in the Philippines, and those funds will be used to equip leaders, provide training and outreach materials, and also do some relief work among the poor. Revy told me this week that in addition to the home-based church, he and his core team are now overseeing 30 house churches in a variety of communities. Those leading the churches are about 40 members of the third, fourth, and fifth generation of disciples, people who have come to Christ, that Revy leads. When Revy gathered all of the house churches, plus the home-based church for an anniversary celebration, 1,200 people came to a rented venue. The Lord is doing amazing things. I could go on and on. Please pray for Revy and his team, as well as for Revy and his family. The biggest challenge that Revy faces is balancing in his own life uh, uh, priorities and maintaining a strong family life with such an expanding ministry. Had to let you know, Dave writes, what the Lord is doing. Thanks again, and to all of hope for your partnership. Now, tell us a little bit about Revy and then transition into Diona. Just keep going with those two. Okay. I want to say personally thanks to all of you who were involved in part of that. It was a big surprise, and it was like, wow, Andrew, that is just incredible. What a delight. And when I told my wife, I said, you won't believe what Andrew has done and the people of Hope Church, and it is such a blessing to us and to world ministry. So you were a channel of incredible blessing that got passed through from us to Philippines, and West Africa. This is Revy, Beth, Chloe, and Ace. That's the family. They're my friends. Revy is a, a dear young pastor, and he and I met in 2004 when we first went through training. And he, at that time, was a youth pastor, and he said, but I've started to multiply my youth but they're getting older and they're starting to get married. I think we'd like to start a church. And he said, then we can continue to have multiplying disciples. Can you come and give some additional training? So you travel out kind of, to me it's the boondocks. It's a windy old two-lane road. For them it's a highway. <laughs> Up the mountains into the northern part of Cebu Province, Philippines. And regularly it's nothing for Revy to hop on a motorcycle or a bus and come down and meet me in Cebu City the second largest city in the Philippines but every once in a while I get to go up to Revy and this picture was taken at Revy's parents home who have a a little bit better home and could host me uh, for several days so anyhow uh, he's just been so instrumental in reaching out and it was They say now that this hurricane that just hit Mexico is the one with the largest recorded Mm -hmm. continuing wind speed. Well, until that happened, they had never had a hurricane on the globe that matched the force of the one that came through Revy's area in the Philippines. They say the Mexicans were better prepared. The Philippines, uh, in the first village that was hit, they were just wiped out. I mean, 10,000 people or something died in the Philippines, and it was flattened. Revy's area had 80% of the buildings damaged or destroyed. Uh, And so it was devastating. But the people, their hunger for relief, for recovery, for hope, led to chances to share the gospel. And he had seven communities where he had churches planted, small groups, house churches meeting, and that's where the expansion came from to go to 35 now in areas that they reached out. We've learned every place we've gone, we have to be not just the head of Jesus sharing the word, we have to be the hands and feet, offering help, hope, hammering a a board back up onto the destroyed house to give them a wall and a tin roof over it, whatever we can do to help them. It can't be just one, can't be only proclamation. We've got to demonstrate our love with our hands and feet, helping them. 
Well, anyhow, I can't keep going on and on, but you can tell I love Revy. And I have great respect for him. So uh, uh, pray for him. I also, Jess, you would be amazed to know, Revy is one of the leaders who coordinates the distribution of shoe boxes in Cebu province, northern Cebu province, Philippines. That's great. I have pictures of Revy with a thousand or more boxes, with a thousand kids out there, and another six or seven pastors next to him and their members starting the distribution process. That's great. So That's there's great. a direct connection yeah. between Operation Christmas Child. And we Christmas didn't know Child. that or plan that. That just no, kind of came up. No, you didn't know yeah. it. I didn't <laughs> know it. <laughs> great. great. Glory so, to God. Glory to so. God. Now, transition to the other side of the world with Diona, who was supposed yeah, to be here. I know. Tell us about him. Yeah, it's kind of a scary story. Um, Diona is an incredible African leader. He's from Monrovia, Liberia. We began to email and then Skype, and he kept saying, please, can you come and give us training? And I kept saying, for a couple of years, we don't have the time or the money to get there. And he's, then finally it became more urgent. Dave, I feel like this is the time. God's telling me that now you should be coming. And I said, let me pray. Pray with me. He says, I am, and I have other people praying with me. I believe it was in 2013 that the decision was made, confirmed that I would go to Ghana, and he would set up a pastor's training. We worked together over there. We worked together to set it up by Skype and email, and then trained uh, someplace between 20 and 25 pastors. I don't always remember every detail in my head. Representing eight countries, eight countries. Uh, don't have time to try to think of them to tell you what they all are. So they began to multiply immediately and train others. By the time uh, Diona's, in the midst of all of this, Diona's suffering incredible tragedy. He has several young children, three I believe. His wife dies because of botched surgery. Medical treatment is just nothing like you can imagine over there, nothing like our standards. He and his children kind of settle in to an apartment that they're living in. It's on low ground. The next thing you know, they get monsoon rains. It's totally flooded. They lose everything. They have to move. Then that's all getting settled, and he's back on the road. He says, I'm back training. Within a week or two of him being back on the road, training, equipping 20, 30 pastors from another country, He's back home in Liberia, and he says, Dave, the worst thing to hit Liberia in decades since we've gone through war after war is now we're fighting a disease called Ebola. He writes me shortly after that and says, people all around me are dying. Some of my closest pastor friends, my... Um, I, I get the relationships mixed up. But then family members start dying. And he says, I have learned and I've done the research. I've talked with medical people. I know how to protect my family. He said, what I'm doing now is getting a group of pastors together. We need help. We need funds. We need to print materials. We need enough money to start traveling, and we've got to have some money for masks and other things to hand out to people so that they can do in-house prevention from Ebola. Next thing you know, we need money because we have to help these people who have it and have finally agreed that they'll stay quarantined in their little house for the amount of time that it takes to be safe. And so some of your funds helped fund those kinds of things mm -hmm. in Liberia to the point that Diona himself writes one day and says, Dave, 
the cupboard is basically bare. I have two or three days that I can give my kids a meal mm -hmm. and safe water. And we rushed, found the whatever we could at the bottom of the barrel and sent him five or seven hundred more. And I said, spend a minimum of a half of this on yourself, please. It goes a lot further over there than it does here, okay? You know, uh, in the old days, you could pull out a quarter or a dollar, and now what's a dollar, you pull out a 10 and a 10's gone, or what used to be a 10, a 100 is gone. The economy, what things cost, just skyrocks, skyrockets. But over there, a few hundred dollars is a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, pray for Diona, he was yeah. supposed to be here. He was out in the boondocks. I had been trying to get a hold of him. He texted me or emailed me on his phone. I don't remember which. He called me one time on his cell phone and said, I'm okay. And then he says, I'll be in touch. Uh, within five or six days, I'll be home. And I haven't heard from him since. Mm. Uh, it is dangerous, as yeah. Andrew said early, yeah. earlier. We don't know. There's traffic accidents. There's disease. There are terrorists of all sorts over there. Mm. Dave, it's uh, sobering to, to hear this, yet at the same time, it's encouraging. And we realize that in the middle of some of these hardships, and uh, we got a flavor of some of that even through what Sandy shared and what Jess shared, <coughs> what we understand through some of this Operation Christmas Child and now through you, that, yeah, there are needs, there are pronounced needs, but that's why it's bigger than us, what yeah. we're talking about this this morning, yeah. is that God would use us. Whether it's the Philippines and the excitement of expansion and multiplication of people coming to Christ, or it's in the one personal situation with Diona and his family and the hardships that he's facing, uh, we, are, we are positioned by God here as a church to whom much is given, much is required. That it's bigger than us. What we have the capability to do and to respond with, we want to do. Today, having three people share with us as a body here at this church helps us understand that to a degree, having you mm -hmm. represent and share. And I know, Dave, you could speak for a long time about these other areas and what God is doing in China and India and Nepal and some of these other places. Sure. I know I've heard you uh, just uh, personally share that with me. But we are, um, this morning wanting to reckon with the fact that it's bigger than us. So what I'd like Amen. to do is uh, close with, uh, again, praying for Diona, especially even hearing Thank more you. now. I have a greater sense of like, let's just really ask God to save him and protect him, especially because of the work that he's doing there. Yeah. And in the perspective of what we learned about through Ukraine and Honduras, you know, what is God calling us to get involved with those kinds of things or other ones that you might have in your heart? So uh, while I pray, I'd love for the band to come up, and we're going to have a chance to give of our uh, offering and gifts this morning. Uh, but uh, let's transition and pray right now uh, for Diona, just as we heard this, and then we'll close out this morning. Yep, thanks. Jesus. Jesus, we are, oh, our, our hearts are uh, overwhelmed in some ways. We hear about this loss and this devastation. And God, I pray that it shakes us up from uh, some of the comfort that we sleep in often, and we can be people, God, who pursue things in this world and in this life that are uh, just kind of like the end game is us, and God, we don't want that, and I pray that this morning you've opened our hearts, and um, maybe you've just kind of tweaked something down our hearts, as Jess said, Lord, to pay attention to those nudgings and the movements of what God might be speaking to you. Don't ignore that. God, I thank you that um, this morning uh, we have a chance through Operation Christmas Child to respond uh, together. Thank you that um, we have a chance this morning through uh, just reflecting and listening. And God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would have spoken something motivating uh, to each of us, maybe something in particular about... Um, how our lives are not bigger than us this morning. And uh, we are motivated, almost catapulted out of that, mercifully by you, that we would have bigger hearts and a bigger vision for what you want to do through us. 
And God, in a moment, we're going to sing a song that will proclaim that you are the God of this city and that greater things are yet to come. And God, it is, in fact, definitely bigger than us, and we want to be part of that. We want to listen to you as we sing and as we give and as we respond in our personal ways now this morning. We pray, Lord, that you um, would show us how big you are and that you invite us into your work. In Jesus' name, amen.